So today's episode is going to be a little bit different than what you're expecting. Uh, I've invited some friends to be on the podcast today. I, actually, I got to tell the truth. I didn't invite these friends. Uh, we were brainstorming on who would be the best co co-conspirators to be on this podcast where I'm going to talk about my new book, Only Tens 2.0. And my editor, Patty Hall, and I came up with uh, some really badass, kick-ass, amazing partners in crime. Shelly Paxton and Dr. Aaron Baker agreed to come on my podcast and help me launch this book. Uh, Patty, uh, excuse me, Shelly has already been a, a guest on the podcast, and we're going to get Aaron on my podcast. But let me tell you a little bit about them. Uh, Dr. Aaron Baker has just launched her transformational coach and speaking career. She is the host of the podcast. Uh, and uh, you have to help me with that. And life in the more, end, life it, in the it, end, life yeah. in the end. That's it. Good life in the end. Uh, how one word can change your life, your business and your world. And I listen to it and it's really kind of amazing, but that's not all, you know, like she's a transformational coach, uh, like, um, like, like no other. She has a doctorate in social psychology. She worked with Facebook and the experience you have and the good experiences you have with Facebook are all because of Erin and her work with Facebook and Microsoft and all those tech companies on how they can suck you in and get you to spend millions of dollars with them. Shelly Paxton, you know her from Soulbatical, the corporate rebel's guide to finding your best life. You know she worked at Harley Davidson and she brings that badassery to her coaching practice. Uh, the two of them uh, just are um, amazing, and I'm lucky to have them. Uh, and Shelly, Aaron, thank you for being here and being my cohorts in figuring out how to tell people about Only Tens 2.0. Oh my God, can we just start by saying, if this isn't a 10, what the fuck is? <laughs> Absolutely. So thank you for helping us just register like, yeah, of course we want to help you do this. Thank you. I, yeah. I just, I just, you know, again, you know, you, you know that the self-consciousness of would anybody want to help me? Does anybody care about it, about what I want? You know, and all this. And then when you were guys were a hell yes, it was like, whew, thank you. I will say I've never responded to any text message with a video until Mark Silverman asked me to be on his podcast. And I had to take three takes to get ex the level of excitement through on video when I said, Hell fucking yes. This is an absolute 10 for me. So thank you. You're so, welcome. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you guys take yeah, over. We're taking over this show. Gonna, yeah. How yeah. We're this isn't your this. show anymore. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. And, and Aaron and I have a little practice. We've become a team. The Aaron and Shelly show might not be far away. <laughs> Absolutely. So, Mark, thank you for letting us experiment on you. <laughs> I, I appreciate it. I, like I've, I've listened to you a couple times together, like on the, on the podcast uh, where, where you interviewed Aaron and it's just hysterical and it's so full of value. So if I get some of that magic here, it's great. We've already created that magic. I, so I'm really curious. Okay, let's jump into this. So yep. I would love just for starters to say, like the fact that you asked us this, it was a hell yes to begin with. And then I reread only tens and I was just like, oh, right. As the universe does, it always serves these things up exactly when we need them the most. So Mark, thank you for writing this. You're and I'm super excited because now that I know some of what's in 2.0 that we get to like excavate on this call, I have literally sat back and gone, oh man, I've got some work to do. Not only in thinking about only tens, like what are my tens and getting super clear, but you've gone way deeper in 2.0. You've like helped me to realize like, oh, this isn't time management. This is life management. This is a way of being. So can you talk a little bit more about your journey and even having that sort of aha moment for yourself and coming to the place of 2.0? Sure. Because Only Tens was, you know, like we were, we were talking before we were recording. Uh, I, I wrote Only Tens for me. I didn't think anybody was going to read it, had no, no illusions that it was going to be anything. So I wrote it for me. I, want, I, I, I remember saying I wanted to get a PhD in how to deal with my ADD and how to, uh, how to be able to focus on things. 
so I wrote the book for me and it's just started selling and it's, you know, it sold thousands and thousands of copies. Uh, and I started doing workshops on only tens. I started coaching people, you know, that, that became, you know, the, the, the wording and how we started things. You know, some of my clients came to me because they were overwhelmed. They were CEOs and, um, and different kinds of leaders and they were overwhelmed. So we would start talking about how to get uh, focused on the right things. And only tens was a good way to use that. I didn't like the book. Uh, I thought the book was really poorly written. I thought the, you know, and you guys, I don't think you guys saw the first version that sold probably 50,000 of the copies, uh, oh, went out wow. with, gram you know, terrible grammar, bad spelling. Uh, and uh, so I was embarrassed by the book. And it wasn't until my assistant, Gail Boo, uh, up-leveled it after I owned the rights that I, I was actually went, oh, wow, this isn't so bad. But Only Tens 2.0 is is done but from a different point of view uh, only only tens if you read it it's like me going oh look at this oh if i focus on this this is really interesting i discovered this and then five years later i've done five years of workshops five years of coaching five years of living this failing at it and uh, when we were starting to write mastering midlife uh, my editor said you know what you're not ready to write mastering midlife only tens needs an update only tens needs to needs to know what have you done with your clients? What did you do in the workshops? What are the pitfalls that people uh, fell into? Because when you take something off your to do list, it comes with a consequence and getting people willing and ready to deal with the consequence of letting go of something was a whole new ball of wax. So that's, that's why only tens 2.0 exists. It's now, now I can have this as a package of something I can leave and move on to mastering midlife. Oh, I'm curious. I know as someone with ADD, you like the shiny new object. You always want to be moving forward, doing new things. How did you get to a place where only 10s 2.0 was a 10 for you? Oh, part of that is trusting experts. You know, like I never liked only 10s, but I would get all kinds of messages. Of, you know, people are giving it, giving it away. People give it to their clients, their CEO clients. Uh, the pe people in the workshops got all kinds of great results. People use the phrasing of only 10s. You know, like you told me uh, before we turn on the, the, the uh, cameras that, you know, you had only 10s written above your business plan. Uh, so people started using that language. And I, st you know, when I went in and reread it, I started to appreciate it. You know, I don't even remember writing half of that stuff. I, I appreciated uh, how pointed it was to me. But then I also saw how it was written very thinly, I guess is the right word. Uh, so I, I didn't explain, you know, one of the tools is difficult conversations. And I name what the difficult conversations are. But in my workshops, I actually do an entire workshop on difficult conversations. So now I can expand on that and tell people how to have difficult conversations, which is what I thought was content for Mastering Midlife. And now I realize, no, this is the completion of Only Tens. Mastering Midlife is a much different book. And Marco, so are some of the things that you're talking about, uh, are these the deeper truths that you surface in 2.0, because I was intrigued, these, these 10 truths that come to life that are directly from client conversations that you've had. I'm guessing those are one-on-one -on -one clients, things you've heard in workshops. You make them, it's so, so, so very clear. So before we even dive into those truths, I'm really curious, like, how did those surface? They surfaced organically. It's every yeah. time I, you know, I, I would, I would be working with, let's say, let's say I'd be working with a new leader who just got promoted uh, and they got their self-esteem from how hard they worked. They outworked everybody. They outperformed everybody, right? They burned the candle at both ends. And now, you know, they have to move from the tactical, the thing that gave them their self-esteem, the thing that got them promoted into a more strategic role. And, you know, they, they have to get their hands off of those day-to-day -day things that they're doing and move into a street. You know, I tell them all the time, your job is to go sit in Starbucks when we could sit in Starbucks uh, and think. That's part of your job. Your job is to lead. Your job is to innovate. Your job is to think. And, uh, and you know, getting them to shift in that way was part of only 10s. It's no longer a 10 for you to do the coding of an Excel spreadsheet for the accounting department. You lead the accounting department. You have people who can do that. And it was really hard to, to, what, you know, to get them to see that, um, 
that their actual worth is in something other than the doing. Mm -hmm. I read through these 10 truths and every single one of them, I'm going, oh, that's me. Oh, that's me. Oh, that's me. Oh, that's my client. That's this client. That's that client. I'm wondering for you, Mark, where do you fall in these 10 truths? Because I know one piece for you was you noticed you fell off the 10 bandwagon and had to get yourself back on. And which truths came up for you as excuses to not jump back into only 10s? You know, I've, I, fall, I fall off the wagon every day. <laughs> like, you know, you know, squirrel. Uh, <laughs> you know, we all fall off the wagon every day. If you open Twitter, you know, if you open Twitter without the express purpose of building an audience, of responding to people that you follow, but just to scroll to see what cute dog pictures are, right, dog pictures are always exempt from false tense. But, uh, uh, you know, you're scrolling through for political, you know, just to get the political vitriol and all that stuff, you know, you're off, you know, you're off your mission, right? You're off, mm -hmm. off, off what you're supposed to be doing. Uh, for me, so that happens every day. What I love about only tens is one, there's only a couple of things that are 10 each day. The 10 mm. list is never long. So if you do the two things that are on your tens list and then watch Netflix all day, you've done only tens. The other thing is for me is when I'm not doing my tens and I notice I'm not doing my tens, I notice that I'm not a victim of circumstance. I've chosen to go off track. And now that's the big difference. That's the big takeaway for me uh, about only tens, what only tens was really about. It was, it was letting go of being the victim of my circumstances and becoming the owner of my experience. You know, mm -hmm. no longer did they, ha do they do that to me? No longer am I so busy because they put that on my plate. I allowed it to be put it on my plate. I didn't have the conversation. I didn't set a boundary. I didn't have an agreement, right? So now I can take responsibility for being overwhelmed. When I take responsibility, there's the power. The power is in knowing that I had a hand in everything that's going on in my life. Yeah. Can I follow up on that, Shelly? Of course. Um, I'm so curious with that because that seems to be such a theme for so many of us is we think life happens to us rather than being the creators or the choosers of our lives. And I've noticed in my work that that is one of the things that people are so resistant to seeing and changing in themselves. So I'm curious from your perspective, how do you help people notice that this is the, the biggest blocker to them creating their life is seeing that it's happening to them. This is where coaching gets really uncomfortable. You know, my, yeah. my, uh, I, I, I have this club called the Disruption and Innovation Club. And uh, it's where we, we do kind of networking, but we do networking really offbeat and really challenging to make it more interesting. And each, each month we do a different theme and owner victim was our theme. Uh, you know, where are you a victim in your life was our theme for last month. And what we, you know, one of the other leaders of the group noticed was every time we confronted someone's victim story, they would just shift the victim story to a little less of a victim story to a little, mm. and then a little less of a victim story. And to get that journey all the way to ownership was really a cat and mouse game. And for me in the coaching, sometimes it's just being really pointed uh, and, and, and throwing in their face, you know, and sometimes it's like, uh, you know, a bad way of training a dog is putting their nose in their mess which I don't advocate because that's the wrong way to train a dog, but that's kind of the way it is, is you just got to hold it and hold it and hold it. And I got to do that for myself because mm. I catch myself with that victim uh, language all the time. Uh, and then I'm like, God damn it, I did it again. You know, like, oh, it just, it just happens. It's so, uh, so unconscious at this point because it's so easy to slip into it. And what I hear you saying is it's almost like building a muscle for ownership. It's you all about kind of, this. Right? All of this to, is a muscle. All of this is a muscle that you have to keep working out and working out. And if you don't work it out, it, it gets smaller, right? I was, ranting at a, I was ranting at a client this morning and I was saying, you know, every freaking self-help book is just bullshit. Every, including mine, all, all self-help books are just bullshit. The real, the real truth is, is that we are nothing but a bag of conditioning, of beliefs, of actions. Uh, every hurt, you know, the, the client was talking about how it was really hard to open emails. Like he can go swim in the ocean with sharks, uh, but opening an email that he thinks is going to be bad news, he can't open it by himself, right? And I'm like, you know what? You're not fighting with the email. You're fighting with what the email represents of something that happened to you when you were four years old that was actually a shark when you were four years old, but isn't a shark now. And that's everything. Everything is a habit. Everything is conditioning. Everything is how we've reacted and responded to everything. So when we get 
when we take ownership, when we wake up, and I think only tens is a way to really kind of either, even wake up deeply spiritually to why we do things, to actually analyze, to slow down and say, wait a second, why is this on my to-do list? Oh, it's on my to-do list because I'm afraid to piss off this person and say no. Oh, why am I afraid to piss off this person? Oh, because they remind me of this and I'm afraid I'm gonna be left out. And all of a sudden we're in seventh grade again Mm. And it's all that. So all these self-help books can just be taken off the shelf if we realize that we're all still living in junior high school. <laughs> and we're all, we're all trapped by our fear. And what you're really talking about is taking ownership over your life and taking ownership over your fear. Yeah. Yeah. It's so, it's so beautiful. And I, so I would love to dive in more into some of these, Mark, because I love the way that you sort of provoke this the beginning of this awareness for your clients. You have a line where you're like, oh, I get it. You can't do tens because blah, right? You call us all out on our bullshit, which I love. I love how direct this is. And I, okay, one of them, I have to look down at my notes to read this because one of these just like, uh, as Aaron said, like they all were like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Like they all hit deeply. And there was one where I went, okay, I've actually got to sit with this for a while. So your O was, oh, I get it. You can't do only tens because if you only do the tens, you'll have to drop something important. And then the real clincher for me in reading this, Mark, was sevens and eights are wily motherfuckers they pretend to be tens and i literally just like dropped to the paper sat back in my chair and had to spend some time with that because i was like oh that's so true and they're just swimming everywhere in my water me too i've had the exact same reaction to that one i think that one's the one that hit me the most and realizing how much even though i committed in february to only tens how many people and projects and things in my world are swimming in that fucking seven and eight pool? That's right. We have like little baby sharks swimming all around us. And you even say, Mark, you're like, the nines are the killers. And I'm like, oh my God, I think it's the sevens and eights that are killing me, let alone the nines. So given yeah. that you've got this sort of roused up, very passionate response from <laughs> us on this one, I would love to hear you talk more about its impact in your own life and then how you've coached clients through this as well. Well, it's in, it's in every, you're making me laugh. Every, it's in every workshop, every workshop when we get to this point of only doing 10, someone raises their hands and goes, but if I only do 10s, I'm going to drop all these things out. And that's when we get to have the discussion of, first of all, how many things do you drop out anyway? How many things do you drop out that were actually 10s, really, really important, things you really wanted to do, real, things that really needed to be done, real, things that needed to be done by you, but you were so busy doing other people's things, uh, so busy doing things that were, were, were easier or, or you know, uh, little rocks as the, versus the big rocks, right, um, that, that those things fell off your plate. They're like, okay, yes, I do drop things off. Now the sevens and eights and nines, the reason why they're so difficult is because we often want to do them. Or, there's someone, or someone asked us to do it who is really important to us, right? Someone asked, you know, like, let's, let's, let's say you guys didn't want to be on this podcast with me. Let's, get, let's say, you, you know, I know you guys love me, right? I know you guys believe in the book, but you're both really busy. And you're like, you know what? I'm writing my own book or I'm doing this and I'm busy. And I really have to be, an, you know, like, I can't really do this. Uh, you know, and so it's, so it's a nine. It's like, I love Mark. This sounds like a really fun thing to do. But I'm, you know, I'm so slammed the next two weeks, it really would take away from something that's important to me. That's a nine, right? So if you go and do a nine, something's, gonna, something's either going to suffer that really was a 10, or you're going to come at it with a little bit of a resentment, a little bit of a, like, you know, like that niggling, oh, God, I just have so much to do. And that's where the overwhelm and the victimhood comes in. I got so much to do, and I got to go do this podcast with Mark and all this stuff. And it, it starts to lose its luster. The, you know, so, and anything below a seven or an eight shouldn't have been on your list in the first place. And I, I, you know, I say I, that um, if it wants to be a 10, it'll come back around and be a 10. Yes. It'll show mm -hmm. back up. You have to trust that it's going to show back up later oh. on. 
uh, in your life. And it does. If it wants to be a 10, someone's going to, you know, if it's like someone asks you to do something and it wasn't a 10 for you and you didn't get back to them and you dropped it out, they're going to send you another note or they're going to call you and say, can you, real, can you do this for me? It's really important. And then you can decide. It's so funny. Erin and I spoke about um, her ands on Life in the And when I was on her podcast. We were talking about mine, which is trust and surrender. Mm. And that just feels mm -hmm. like it's screaming through in this particular truth because we don't trust and we rarely surrender. <laughs> So, so that's growth right there. That brings me back to like the, when, when I first, this whole only tens thing first came up was that, you know, when I realized that I actually only ever do what I want to do, like I, that's the honesty part. It's like, we only ever do what we really want to do. If we're people pleasing, even though we're grumbling, I don't want to do this. We want to be the people pleaser. We want those people to like us. So we're doing what we want to do. We're always doing what we want to do. I don't want to go to my job. Well, you want the paycheck and you want the health insurance. So you want to go to the job. You're lying to yourself if you say no. So once I started to see that, that, uh, oh, you know, I, when I wanted to run the Marine Corps Marathon, I ran the Marine Corps Marathon. If there's a new iPhone, it doesn't take me long to get one, right? It's not that hard. But when there's something that's, that, that, I, that I don't want to do, it doesn't get done. Mm -hmm. Even though I say it's important and I put it on my to-do list and I keep moving it to the next day's to-do list and the next day's, it doesn't get done. Like my taxes, it doesn't get done. It doesn't get, but when it's a 10, what I'll do is I'll have my friends be on Zoom with me. We'll open up Zoom. We'll do a work session. I'll say, I'm doing my taxes. It gets done in 15 minutes because it was a 10, even though I had resistance, it was a 10. So how do you know it's a 10? Because it got done. Mm. And that, that just redefines want, because I think so often we think of, oh, I only do what I want to do being that I'm only messing around. I'm only doing things that are fun and desirable. But at the end of the day, we have things that need to get done and therefore we want to get them done. And so it's just a flipping everything on its head as to what really is a, a want for us. It's finding, it's finding the want. Yeah. Right? It's fi finding the want in sitting down and paying the bills every month, right? Mm -hmm. It's finding the, oh, I want to be in good standing. I don't want the penalties. I don't, oh yeah. And you know what? I actually do want to pay my bills. Yeah. And I, I think that's what makes only tens so profound is you're not saying, hey, everybody just go off and do the two things you most want to do to fuck around all day. You're actually bringing in such a broader view of only tens. And it's I wrote only tens on my wall in February, having not read the book. And I now have a completely different perspective of what only tens truly is. Yeah. Don't, and the you, fact don't, that don't throw the baby out with the bathwater though. Yes. You stay know, with only, the, the wants and desires tens, too. It really is about following your energy. Absolutely. You know, like, try, like this whole conversation started with our mutual friend, Rich Litvin, about me trusting where my energy is going. So if one day I'm supposed to be sitting and doing grunt work or, you know, busy work on my, 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 um, my company, you know, my, 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 um, or I try and I, what do I have? I have a company, I have an organization, I have a practice, whatever I have, uh, you know, to work on that. Um, but all of a sudden I feel the inspiration to go do some videos, or I feel the inspiration to call someone like to trust that also, uh, was yeah. really, a, uh, so my intuition, uh, you know, and my guts instincts, really sharpen with only tens. Like I would call people and they would be like, how did you know I needed to talk to you? You know, that kind of thing. I love that because it's tied to exactly what you said earlier about being honest with ourselves because we lie to ourselves so much when we're lying, we're up here and our ego is driving. When we trust mm -hmm. our instinct, we're down here. You can't see where I'm pointing, but trust that it's someplace safe. <laughs> you can tell by the yeah. change in your voice. When you talk about your head, you're, you're talking, yeah. we're up here. And when yeah. you talk about your gut, we're down here in our down gut. It, it automatically yeah. switches you down. And yeah. that's what you just said is so fascinating because so many people come to me asking, how do I connect with my intuition? you're giving this tried and true method. And this is beyond, like Shelly said at the outset, this is not just tools for productivity. This is tools for self-connection and self-trust and learning to have a better relationship with yourself. 
you asked me when I was when I was a yes to 2.0 because I was a hard no, hard no, hard no to 2.0. I became a yes to 2.0 when I realized that this was the end. Because I what I really care about is people discovering who they are. What I really care about is is ending ending the bondage. You know, freeing people uh, to see who they are, what they are, the power and and um, the freedom that's really in uh, being uh, um, alive. Uh, and only tens for me felt like rearranging chairs on the deck of the Titanic, like just more self-help bullshit. And when I saw that actually getting conscious uh, and looking at what I'm doing with my time and my attention, really getting conscious and, and doing self-inquiry, which every deeply spiritual book will ever point you to is self-inquiry, learn yourself. When I realized that only tens was such a great stepping stone into that world, I was like, okay, this is actually profound. And I, you know, I feel weird saying it. It was profound for me. And it's profound for anybody that I bring it to because it's sometimes the first time anybody ever gets conscious to why they do what they do. Mm. It's so powerful. I really wanted you to talk more about how this has aligned with your spiritual journey, because I know how spiritual you are. I know how powerful that is. It makes you who you are and it makes your work in the world that much more profound. Is there, is there kind of a next evolution of this? Like, where do you see this going as you're on this spiritual journey and now you see these two things so beautifully aligning? What comes up for you? So for, for me, this, this actually gives me this, the stepping stone to Mastering Midlife. It ch this changes what the book Mastering Midlife is going to be about. Because now the how-to is in Only Tens 2.0. Now that's a nice, neat little package of an introduction into a lifelong practice of self-inquiry. Uh, and which also breeds, you know, it leads right into self-forgiveness, which to me is, you know, someone, someone wrote on Facebook, you know, what's, what's the greatest, what's the greatest uh, benefit your clients get from you? And, you know, my clients get promotions and more money and, you know, they, they sharpen their leadership skills and all those wonderful things. But for me, when a client finally is free yes. from the prison that they put themselves in, you know, I don't care if they have a hundred million dollars in the bank, right? And all that, you know, they, almost everybody I meet is in a prison. And when they get free from that prison, that's satisfying to me. And that's a lifelong practice. So if I can use only tens to get people to, to slowly wade into the waters and then bring them deeper into that freedom, the whole journey is worth it for me. So that's what mastering, mm -hmm. that's what mastering midlife is going to be about. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid to say it because I'm afraid that's the book I'm, you know, I'm now afraid to write now, now that we've moved me, we've moved the, 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 the piece on the board so far forward by doing 2.0 uh, that uh, all, the, all the filler that I was going to put in Mastering Midlife is now all in 2.0. It's now neatly packaged and Mastering Midlife now has to be that, that, that you know, like, like Solbatical. Solbatical was, a, was a, um, uh, such a deeply moving thing for you to do. Mastering Midlife is going to be that for me. And for you're you. Oh, sorry. Right I was there. gonna say, and I saw well, you keep saying for you, and I'm just I'm hearing you wrote only tens for you, and now mastering midlife sounds like it's for you, and yes. eventually for some other people. If it, you, it, only, mastering midlife is for me, and if anybody else help, if anybody else you know finds it resonates, that's awesome. But yeah, I only I only do any of this for me. I know that. Have you started writing mastering midlife? This new, more edgy, more vulnerable version of it. I have, as I was right, uh, the, the assignment that I got from my editor was to just keep writing. Just write, 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 write. So every morning I, every morning I would sit on my, my meditation cushion and instead of meditating, I would put on a very specific pair of reading glasses that were only, only sat on my altar. Uh, and I put on my beads uh, that were given to me by uh, Dr. Uh, Andrew Bonici, who wrote uh, Boundless Intimacy. And that's how he wrote Boundless Intimacy, was getting into a meditative state and letting it flow through him. So mm -hmm. I would sit on my meditation, you know, do I have to really reveal this? I would sit on my meditation cushion and with the beads and the glasses, and I would, in, at, at 5.30 in the morning, and I would just write whatever came through me. And then after about a month and a half of just writing whatever came through me, 
it looked really clear. Three quarters of it went to only tens 2.0. So we put those in its own bucket. And then about 25, 30, 40% of it was mastering midlife and the more deeply um, spiritual explorations. Uh, so that got moved over to that. So that part is, al that part is already written. Uh, came very clear what belonged in this book and what belongs in that book. Thank you for sharing your process too, because I'm always intrigued how people write, how it comes through you, how you can be a vessel for this brilliance. And so thank you for sharing that. It's, you know, I, I, again, it feels so weird to, to acknowledge uh, I, I, uh, that I, you know, I'm going through the final edit of 2.0, but you know, it's going to it's going to come out the day after this podcast comes out. But right now I'm in the final edit and I'm reading it. And I don't remember writing half of the stuff that I, that I wrote. I really don't remember writing. I'm like, wow, this is, this is really good. I should take some of this advice. Talk about a flow yeah. state, right? That right. almost perfectly describes what happens in a flow state. And a little bit of a surrender, right? A little trust and surrender that what needs to come out will come out at the right time and will get put in the right places. Yeah, and it's, it's, more, it's amazing. I feel, I feel so satisfied with 2.0. I just feel so complete and satisfied. Even if nobody, even if nobody reads it, I feel satisfied. Like, like ooh, done, packaged. And we know people are going to be reading this in droves. I know for me, I'm already ready to go out and talk about it with all the people in my community. I'm sure Shelly is ready to do the same thing. I mean, I'm like copies to all of my clients, going to be rereading it myself once a month just to get back on the wagon. Thank you. Okay. I've, and I have a confession to make. So all the things Aaron said and... I actually used this in a coaching conversation this morning. So did I. I actually did this morning with a client. And I totally, I just want to say like, I gave you credit. I'm like my brilliant friend, Mark Silverman, funny enough, going to be interviewing him this afternoon, but this is so perfect. And I was just yeah. looking up the truth. So the truth that we were talking around is... It's amazing how much we actually train people to treat us exactly how we need to be treated. Doesn't that right? hurt? Isn't oh. that painful? It's like a dagger yeah. to the heart, right? And she was struggling with exactly this. And I've so been there. Like, I just felt it. <laughs> I felt it so deeply. And this is another one that I have to remind myself because we really do fail to establish those boundaries. Yes. And so oh. Mark, I'm, I'm really curious around, around this one. Like, can you help for everybody who's maybe hearing this for the first time and seeing like, and I'm guessing doing kind of the gasp and awe, like we did, like, oh, I feel this one. Can you give us a little bit more of like, how have you seen this come up and how have you coached clients through it? This is a doozy. So again, that's in taking responsibility. And sometimes it's really delicate. You know, you guys are coaches and you know, you, it's hard to see in ourselves, but it's easy to see when you're talking to someone else is, oh, well, over the years, uh, you have said yes to every piece of work that they ever gave you. You've never said no, you've never set a boundary. Uh, people who are overwhelmed are going to give away to the person who's doing the most work in the organization, right? Uh, you know, uh, uh, and I think the illustration I used in the book was I have a client who was the absolute most competent person in the entire organization. He was a C-level executive, but he was the guy everybody went to when they needed something proofread, when they needed something worded right, when it was going to go out. Every, every single person went to him and, and his thing was this place couldn't run without me. It just wouldn't run without me. So that was his badge of honor, that this place just wouldn't run without me. Uh, so we have to separate his self-esteem of the hero complex first, right? Then we have to say, oh, have you ever said no to anybody when they put something on your plate? And he's like, no, I can't. I simply can't. The organization would crumble. I'm like, okay, let's, let's unpack the, you know, your, your, your delusions of grandeur. And by the way, you are the most competent person there. You really are as brilliant as everybody says you are and as you think you are. But, uh, and his favorite, his favorite phrase now that he has taken from our coaching is, uh, not my circus, not my monkeys. Right? Love. <laughs> like, yep. he doesn't have to save every department. He doesn't, he can pick and choose his battles when it's really important, when his expertise is going to help. But he had to start saying no. 
And that was all completely new to him to go, okay, I'm not going to look over this press release because it's not from my department and they, they don't need me. It's good enough the way it is. I'm not going to worry about it. And what happened was people would start to step up. Then the next thing that happened was he started making manuals on how to do what he knew how to do best and then handing them off to people. So now he's, now he's learning how to create new leaders, right? And he now has a personal life which he didn't have before. His identity isn't in lockstep with, what the, with, with the organization. He now has his own identity and he works at the organization, very, very different. So, uh, you know, he saw that he, treated, he taught the entire organization that he could be counted on at two o'clock in the morning to make sure what needed to be done at six o'clock in the morning was done. And now he's treating, he's, he's taught people that he's not the guy to go to He's the guy to go to, to ask how, you know, you know, to give feedback and all that stuff. And it's so much more peaceful for him. Well, and what part of what I love, Aaron, this is something you and I talk about all of the time, but it's like what you just described is ripples of impact. We talk about how, so one person making these changes, these very personal life decisions can start to impact everyone around them and imagine how much that impacts the organization, the team, the organization, the culture, the world. It's a really beautiful thing from just doing this one thing and determining one human's tens. Yeah. And it's, it's turning this idea of control on our heads too, because as we move up in leadership positions, there's this sense of, I need to control everything so everything doesn't fall apart. What you're saying is, no, you control you. Let's take back your control of you and everything else will be taken care of. You don't need to tightly squeeze control out of everything. And I find that that was the conversation I was having with my client this morning around, what does she do when she can't be in control? And I'm like, control you. Yeah, as, be, as best we can. <laughs> right, as, as best, best as can. you can. And, and when you control you and teach yourself to the control, the, the ripples of impact come, right? As, as Shelly and I have talked about, now everybody else is learning what's their flavor of taking back control over their responsibilities. What are their tens? And downstream, what gets changed? And when we model this, other people go, oh, wait a second, I can do that? Right. <laughs> I think that's the beauty in some of this, like, believe me, I'm like, a, I'm like, you know, a, a clinical liar when it comes to myself, right? I lie oh, yeah. to myself all the time. And so when it's like, I start to excavate some of that truth and live into that truth, it's going to impact other people. And I hope that it shows them that they can, you know, do that for themselves and make the same decisions. And now they have a framework for doing it. It's so interesting to hear people describe me as decisive, as um, strong-willed, as, uh, as uh, impactful, uh, and as someone who sets boundaries and you know, knows himself and all that. Because you know, that wasn't me. That's not, how, that's not how I ever saw myself and that's not how I acted in the world. I was pretzel boy, right? Like I was, I constantly twisted myself into a pretzel to fit every situation. And I don't do that anymore. And it's natural now, but it was so uncomfortable when I first started doing that because I didn't have knees and elbows in the world. I just kind of zigged and zagged in the world. So I never made a ripple in the world. When I started to actually exist and take up space and have knees and elbows, I noticed that people pushed back. Oh, there's a reason why I didn't have knees and elbows before because I don't like the pushback. So my nervous system had to learn how to actually live and take up space in the world, which is boundaries, which is speaking up, which is asking for what I want, right? Which is having a, a strong opinion. Uh, and now, you know, going, going toe to toe with the world, uh, with my own knees and elbows and my own opinions and thoughts and all that stuff is, is, a, is a natural thing for me. So people would never see the old pretzel boy Mark in who I am today. I think one of the things we're also scared of, Mark, when you talk about that, I love the knees and elbows. Like, let's use our knees and elbows. And one of the things I know, I'll speak from personal experience, that I'm often really scared of is, what is how is this going to impact my relationships? That is the stickiest, scariest one for me. Did you have that feeling when you were just starting to implement only tens in your own life? And how did it impact your relationships? My, my ex-wife, Robin, used to say, uh, you know, when you walk into a room, 50% of the people are going to like you and 50% of the people aren't going to like you, except Mark. 100% of the people like Mark. And that was by design. Like I 
I created the world that way because I was so terrified as a kid because I was so ostracized and brutalized as a kid that I, my way of being in the world was to make sure uh, everybody liked me, right? I sent out a connection uh, immediately so that I was safe, right? So that's my superpower to make sure everybody liked me. When I started saying no, when I started setting boundaries, when I started not being a good boy, quote unquote, uh, there were people who didn't like it. Now, the people who don't like it, because again, I trained everybody in, their, in my world to know that Mark will always be there. He's always Johnny on the spot. He's always going to you know, do whatever needs to be done. He's always going to pick that up from the store. He's always going to take that extra work. He's always going to do those things. When I stopped doing that, the people who didn't like it uh, were in two camps. The people who needed me in their life to be that pretzel boy, to be that people pleaser, went away. The people in my life who were healthy, who were in my relationships, who were good, they adjusted. Mm. And then there were people in my life who knew how to set boundaries and knew how to do that thing. And they were just fine. They, like, they, were, they were cool. <laughs> but the people, the, the, it does change the relationships with people who are absolutely used to and need you to be that people pleaser. So you can always tell. And it was really scary for me to have people not like me. It was scary for people to not be happy with me. Again, that's why only tens go so deep because when someone's not going to like you, like you don't go magically go, I'm only going to do tens and I'm going to set a boundary. And everybody's going to be like, I love that you set a boundary and you're not going to go pick up the kids from uh, soccer practice, right? Your wife is just not going to be thrilled with the fact that she has to go do it because she was doing all these other things, but you had something at work that you had to do, right? And now, you know, people are going to get irritated. Now, how do, you, how do you grow? So for me, grow in my nervous system to be able to actually be in the same room with someone who's irritated with me and to not take it on, years of work to be able to actually be in a room with someone who doesn't like me or doesn't like what I did. Still wince, but now it's, it's so much more authentic and so much more real and so much more juicy. I tell my clients all the time, I said, look, dude, if you, you know, especially my male clients, I'm like, if you set boundaries, you, you ask for what you want, and you're clear about all these things, it's going to be wonders for your sex life. A woman loves a man who knows his own mind, right? Like I constantly have this conversation. I love that. Yeah. And it, what it, I'm hearing from you is there's a simple formula to all of this stuff. Only tends to the simple formula and it's not easy. It's work. It's a journey. It's a constant coming back. And I think that's such an important reminder to all people who are going through the work that it's, it's, don't tell people simple. that. Don't tell simple. people that. It's, 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 only, it's, only, it's, tens, it's, only tens really is so confrontational. It's about taking how you've lived your life yeah. and how you know, through your conditioning and how you've set up your life you know, for all the fears, all the things, all the, you know, underneath the yeah. surface and saying, hey, let's get conscious and change all that yep. and walk into all the things that scare us. But I don't want to tell people that. I want them to find out by accident. <laughs> okay. Like, oh, Mark, I set a boundary and they hate me. Now what do I do? Right? <laughs> Lean into the suck. Right? <laughs> oh, yeah. As Brene says, embrace the suck. The suck. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, but Mark, it's so how- worth it, right? Oh, right. I want to I say it's not simple. It's a simple formula. It's not easy, but it is life-changing. It is game-changing. Do it. So go yeah. ahead, Shelly. I'm so happy uh, to have you guys I, here no, to was, say these things. <laughs> no, I was just nodding because I'm like, oh yeah, what she said. Oh, and <laughs> I just remember my question. And so Mark, how how do you recommend getting into this, right? So I I reread this and Aaron reread this and we're both like, oh my God, okay, now we get we get it. And it's it's literally making me rethink everything, which I know is what it's intended to do. How do you recommend starting? Like what's the first, we always, we usually talk in terms of tiny steps as coaches, right? Is there a tiny step here or is it like just cannonball into the deep end and hold your breath? Like what do you do? So for me, I do everything a cannonball into the deep end. I make okay. declarations and I'm going on a juice cleanse, not for two days, but for seven days. Like I, I, I make... I make those declarations uh, uh, and, and it's the only way I know how to do things. I tell people, if you can do it incrementally, you know, do that. Don't jump into the deep end the way I do. 
Uh, but actually everything is baby steps. You cannot live life tomorrow. So you can't say I'm gonna do only tens for the rest of my life. You can't do only tens for the rest of your life. You can only do only tens for the next conversation. You can only do only tens for what you have to do right now. You can only do it in this moment. So it's baby steps. It's, oh, you know, so when I teach people, when someone asks you to do something, because no is so hard to say. So next time someone asks you to do something, just practice and say, may I get back to you with, on that? Just may I get back to you on that? Mm. You know, may I check my, can I check my calendar? And that gives you a pause. It gives you a beat to get conscious, right? So that's, that's where you go first, is in the moment, let's just take a baby step and say, you know what? I may or may not want to do that. I want to think about it. So let me get back to you on that. And then you take a beat and you phone, you know, you phone a friend and go, you know what? Someone asked me to do something and my automatic yes was there, but I don't know whether I want to do it or not. Can you just sit with me for a moment while I figure out whether or not I want to do it? Because people pleasers don't even know their own mind often, you know, when people are first new to setting boundaries and speaking up and that kind of thing. This is also really good for, uh, amazingly competent overachievers who actually do run through the list. This isn't just for people who are so delicate and people pleasers like me. They're, it's for people who, you know, just, just get their self-esteem from just doing so much shit and they're always overwhelmed and they, they burn the candle at both ends. This is about now, how do you do the deep work? Like there's so many books written on the deep work, the one thing, right? Um, Derek Sivers says, hell yes, hell yeah. There's nothing new about this. But this is now gives you a, a way to go, huh, let me look at the qualifier in this. Why is this on my to-do list? Do I want to do it? Or do I not want to do it? So the baby step is with each item, just today, just try something. Don't go pissing off everybody. Just say, you know, one thing, ask for one piece of help. You know, you start there. And I have to say personally, for me, what you said about slowing down, taking that beat, maybe even taking a few beats Rich, you know, who you, you know, who you credit in the book for just getting you on a roll with like asking questions about only tens, Rich always slows me down and says, just say, I'll, can I sleep on that? Mm -hmm. And so I'm really trying to do that. I'm trying to buy myself more than a few minutes. I'm trying to buy myself a whole fresh perspective when I wake up in the morning to say, yeah, is it a 10? Or is it, am I just really, I really like that person and I don't want to let them down because I experience that a lot. Yeah. I, I use the I, word, I use the word uh, you know what, you're a 10 for me, but this event is not. Like, ooh, I really, I, you are ooh. so important to me. You See, are a 10 for me, but I cannot come to your workshop or your event. I really want to support you, but, you know, I can't do that. that and, and, you know, that, that's, again, those are the nuances of how to work relationship around setting a boundary. And that's such a huge thing. So one of the things I studied in grad school was how do you reject someone in a way that looks kind and socially competent? And what you've just given is such a beautiful way to reject the event and not the person and to separate out their worth from this thing that you're saying no to. And I know so many of us, the reason we can't stick to only tens is because we are so afraid of being unkind in saying no, being unkind and, and hurting someone else's feelings. And First of all, you're not responsible for their feelings. But second of all, you can minimize it with that beautiful language. So thank you, Bark. That's, that's absolutely brilliant. I know. I was literally like, do you also have in this book like some more scripts like that? Right. <laughs> I'm sitting here going, I need like the, the only tens note cards all around my office. I'm even looking at the qualifiers. Like, does this need to get done? Does this need to get done by me? Does this need to get done by me today? Whoa. <laughs> I need those everywhere. Thank I you. you I, 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 how, how's this for arrogant? I actually separated the learning curve for how to set a boundary into three levels. Like, <laughs> like uh, I'm so proud of myself that I did this. And level level one is uh, is the is the sheepish. Um, oh no, level one is. Uh, you, you take it, you take it, you take it, you do it all, you do it all, you do it all, and then you've had enough and you just get really pissed off and you set a boundary and it's like, I can't do another thing. You're always doing this thing and it's really messy and you, and you, and you, you know, there's wreckage and you know, there's, there's very little emotional intelligence and all that. Level two 
is okay now you understand that nobody's doing anything to you but you're still terrified of of uh of looking selfish or looking like you're not helping, you know, all this stuff. So level two is where you kind of sheepishly go say, you know what, I, I really can't do that. I'm really sorry, but I can't. And you apologize and you're just selling them on the idea that you can't, you have to set a boundary and the boundaries, the boundary is perfectly okay. Don't you know that this boundary is okay? And then the last, you know, when masterful is when you just matter of factly say, you know what, um, you're really important to me. Uh, I love you, and I can't be. I won't. I won't be at your party, you know. Or you know, I cannot take that piece of work on. Yeah. Uh, and you just do that, uh, and that's yep. where the love and the connection can come in because mm. the fear is out now. When you start to when you start to get comfortable with setting a boundary, and you know it isn't a reflection of them or you, and you can now now really do what's important, which is the relationship piece, and then the action is secondary. Yeah. Well, what you have unknowingly done is validated some of my science findings, which is that if you apologize, any form of saying sorry diminishes you. It makes you look less kind and it makes you look less socially competent. So what you're basically saying is stop apologizing and set a goddamn boundary. (laughs) (laughs) And do it with compassion. And do it with compassion. People try to apologize because they think that softens the blow. What you're saying is, no, just be firm and you can still give them a lot of love and say, I love you. I love everything you do. I just can't do this. Right. Yeah. And you can, also, you, you can also punctuate it with a thank you. And a thank you. Know, yeah. thank, you for, thank you for understanding. I really appreciate you understanding. Mm-hmm. Boom. You're done. I you're love out. it. And you're owning it from beginning to end because the thing that we're not really owning is often the apology. We're saying right. it because we think we have to say it and it's right. coming off as hollow. We're not owning. Because you're not just, sorry. You're right. And on the other side, it. on the other side, that's what happens. The people say, don't, it's the Rihanna song. Don't tell me you're sorry because you're not. <laughs> I love it. Very and good. it's true, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mark, there's so much juiciness in yeah. here. Like, I... Yeah. I'm so excited. I think Aaron said this earlier. I to like not only reread this to start practicing it. I might do some version of cannonballing in the deep end. I'm a little Me bit. Too. Like- I'm a cannonballer. <laughs> I'm like, there's a reason we all three get along. I know. It's like I'm going. I'm going whole hog into this, and to start buying it from my clients. Like yeah. they, I, I can, I can think of like, I could literally have this conversation with every single client. I love that it started this morning because it was like a celebration of what's happening today in this conversation and your genius that you've brought into the world. And I'm really grateful for that. Thank you for sharing it with us. No, thank you. And thank you for helping me bring this out. It's really hard to talk about your own, your own thing and do it justice. So I appreciate your enthusiasm and your, you're pulling it apart uh, and uh, helping people know what's in there. Uh, so for, for people who are listening and for your clients, there are videos that go with only tens, uh, and only tens 2.0. So that walks through the processes, walks through the worksheets. Cause the book is full of worksheets that I give in my workshops. So there are ways to walk through this. How do you set a boundary? What do you do when you have a resentment? You know, what do you do when you're overwhelmed and you don't know how to do something? So I give all those instructions because I had to learn each one of them on my own, or I had to watch my clients work them on. So it, it's, uh, this, there's going to be a lot of resources that go with this. Ooh, this I is cannot the wait. This, class. I know. this is, yeah, I, I think I'm going to be reading this and rereading this and recommitting to only tens uh, on a regular basis. Thank you. And we, need a little, we got a little accountability group yeah. right here. And I'm, I'm a little secretly excited for whatever juice is coming out of Mastering Midlife, because if that's the book you're scared to write, it is going to be phenomenal. It, it's going it, to, I think, I think for me, it's, it's going to be a, it's going to be a journey of, of sweat. So I appreciate that. So would you do me a favor since this is my podcast, uh, 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 Aaron, would you tell people where they can find you? Absolutely. So you can find me on my website, uh, AaronMBaker.com. There's a lot of Aaron Bakers out there. Uh, you can follow my podcast, Life in the End. Mark, we should get you on the podcast as soon as possible. And lastly, I run a Facebook community of game changers who are out to have a big ripple of impact in the world called the Heart Leader Launchpad. And anyone who's in an entrepreneurial journey to, to make an impact, come play with me. Incredible. Thank you. Uh, and Shelly, where can people find you? 
Uh, you can find me. My website is soulbatical.com. That's two B's and one T. Instagram is my playground at soulbatical on Instagram. And you can read the book. It's a good starting point, which is Soulbatical, A Corporate Rebel's Guide to Finding Your Best Life. And you can buy it anywhere books are sold. So uh, let me also a add, rebel, Re wait, Rebel Souls Podcast. Oh, rebel Souls Hello. Podcast. Thank you. <laughs> oh my God. Thank you. I almost forgot. So yes, Rebel Souls podcast, Aaron and I launched our podcast right around the same time. Um, Rebel Souls podcast, it, again, subscribe to it anywhere you listen to your favorite podcasts or just find it on my website. Easy peasy. And also you can find all of this on the uh, show notes for this show. I'm going to put uh, at you, how to get in touch with Aaron and uh, Shelly in the show notes. I'm also going to put a link to their conversations that they had without me uh, mm -hmm. on both of their podcasts because uh, you'll learn a lot. I was taking notes in the, when I was listening to them uh, because they're much more educated than I am. They're smarter than I am. And nope. their, turn of, their turn of phrase <laughs> is amazing. So I learned a ton from them. Ladies, thank you so much for this. This is really amazing. Well, thank, thank you, you, Mark. Thank you. To everybody else, you know, you know, your time and your attention is precious to me. I appreciate you spending it with, with us. Uh, love yourself. Be kind to yourself. We're still in some really rough times. Drink lots of water. Get rest. Be kind to everybody. I love you. Have a great rest of the day.